fat lady, I mean the obese lady, she is pretty punch, punch, punchy. Uh, she does have a little bit of extra, I think it's a woman. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, that's a woman, I guess. Uh, fat cells uh, release a protein called pigment epithelium derived uh, factor, uh, PEDF, into the bloodstream which causes muscle cells in the liver to become desensitized to insulin. And this is where type 2 diabetes comes from. Because all this stuff is being released into your system, your fat is a toad, uh, this stuff is being released into your system, now all of a sudden you've got you have type 2 diabetes because your body is no longer sensitized to insulin. It's desensitized. The pancreas attempts to compensate by producing more insulin. This isn't good. As the person gets more and more obese, the pancreas may react by slowing or even stopping insulin production. And all of a sudden, you've got full-blown diabetes. Stress. As odd as this sounds, so why in the world are so many minority, do so many minority people have a problem with, with, uh, with diabetes? It could have something to do with stress. Stress causes diabetes. <clears throat> it's one of the factors, especially those suffering from type 1 diabetes. Uh, the more stress that they're under, the worse their diabetes is. Researchers have discovered that people suffering from type 1 diabetes have greater variability in their glucose with stress than people who do not suffer from diabetes. Uh, I said that I wasn't pissed off. What happened over the weekend was it was Easter. I don't know if you noticed that or not. You know, all those eggs and bunnies and... Everything closes. Everything closes. Everything closes. Everything closes. Everything closes. Can't go anywhere. They have all the shit. That's <coughs> Really bad movies on television. <laughs> uh, and everybody was gone. Everybody was gone from the uh, Hogan housing, the faculty housing. You know, all the Navajos were gone. From they, they went home, damn it. So I was like the only guy there. It was the only guy. You went home? No. Anyway, I was the only guy. I, I got home. My wife is in Florida. So I called her on the phone. She wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't talk to me. Anyway, that's why I'm so pissed off. <clears throat> I had a lonely weekend. I ran with my dog. Clay was out. That bastard. <laughs> Abnormal blood sugar responds, uh, responses uh, to challenging events in conjunction with high levels of stress may directly contribute to diabetes. Stress and diabetes. Stress equals diabetes if you're not careful. Stress may also indirectly promote diabetes by reducing compliance with treatment, of course, because you're so stressed you can't do that. Most people with diabetes can control their disease through lifestyle modifications. This is true, damn it. You can fix it or you can arrest it. You can slow it down. If you change your diet, stop eating all that sugary crap, all that fat crap. You need to eat more fiber. You need to eat more vegetables. You need, eat, need to eat more fruits. You need to lose weight. The reason you've got diabetes is because you're paunchy. You've got too much fat cells. You need to do something. You need to exercise regularly. You need to use insulin if necessary. So that's all you need to do. You could, if you change your lifestyle, if you change your diet, you, you uh, uh, reduce your weight and you exercise regularly, you can control your, your diabetes. I had a sister-in-law, I hope my wife doesn't watch this. I had a sister-in-law, came down with diabetes because she was under so much stress. The reason she was under so much stress was because she hated her husband. I stay married to somebody that's driving you crazy. So eventually she divorced the guy, and then she did what she always wanted to do. She always wanted to be a teacher, so she went to school to become a teacher. And she realized the only reason she wanted to be a teacher was so that she could show everybody how smart she was. That's no reason to be a teacher. You, so rather than focusing on her students, she was focusing on herself and uh, showing that she could, uh, that she was smarter than everybody else. Real, and she came down with diabetes. 
in the beginning, she was a hiker. She uh, she only she never ate anything white, which sounds strange, I know, but uh, she never ate anything white. So she didn't eat mayonnaise. She didn't eat uh, cauliflower. She never ate mashed potatoes. She didn't eat anything white. She only ate green things and red things and brown things, but never anything white. And that's how she controlled her diet. She was doing really well. She was hiking every day. She was, uh, she was uh, controlling her uh, diet by not eating anything that, that had any fat in it. Uh, and she was controlling her weight. She was staying fairly slim. And then her daughter had a baby. And the daughter wanted her to help take care of the baby. And she went and started taking care of the baby. And all of a sudden, everything went out the window. And she became depressed with her. And her husband started harassing her to come back home. And the stress made her stop doing all the things that made her, that allowed her to control her, her, her diabetes. And she died. She died of her diabetes. <clears throat> her kidneys shut down. She decided not to get go into dialysis. And about two weeks later, she went into a coma. And about four weeks later, she died. She was in a coma for four weeks. Painful, ugly stuff. I don't know if you understand what your kidneys do, but they clean all the toxins out of your, out of your system. And she, her, her kidneys weren't functional. So she slowly died of toxicity. She, all this poison accumulated in her body. And she died of toxicity, which is not, it's not uh, fun, and, it's, it, it, and it is painful. She died in a great deal of pain. As stupid as that sounds, all she had to do was go to dialysis, but she didn't do it. All she needed to do was go back to her, her old way of doing things, but she wouldn't do it because she was so un, so stressed out. She just wanted to do it. She committed suicide. Yes. Because she refused to take care of it. That's what alcoholics do when they drink. You tell them that you're dying, you, your, your liver is, doesn't work anymore. If you continue to drink, you'll kill yourself. Do they stop drinking? No. You tell somebody who has COPD, that, who's on oxygen, that they need to stop smoking and maybe they can prolong their life. Do they stop smoking? Hell no. They take off their oxygen mask and smoke a cigarette and then they put their oxygen mask back. It's suicide. They're killing themselves. Does that make me mad? Yeah, sure it makes me mad. I'm a psychologist. And also a medic and I understand all this stuff. Uh, patients, uh, see, I sound angry, don't I? What the hell's wrong with me? Patients' knowledge, uh, beliefs, and behavior strongly affect the ability to manage diabetes. Uh, Self-management is a cornerstone of treatment. I'm not mad at you guys. I'm, I'm mad because I'm not home. That's what I'm mad about. And I haven't seen my wife in I don't know, two months. <clears throat> and she wouldn't talk to me yesterday. Something was going on at my son's house. Self-management is the cornerstone of treatment. Uh, most people are able to control their diabetes through lifestyle modifications. As we said before, change your diet, regulate your weight, exercise regularly, and if need, uh, inject yourself with insulin. Now, the funny thing about insulin, if you don't have an insulin pump, is that you have to shoot it into your, into your stomach. You have to put it in the fat of your stomach. It, has, it needs to be close to your liver. So instead of injecting yourself in, your, in your, the muscle of your arm or your leg, you have to inject it into your belly. Your belly fat, actually. Uh, circulating glucose can uh, be monitored through finger sticks or venipuncture. Uh, once upon a time, all we did were glucoses, and then we discovered hemoglobin A1Cs. Now, hemoglobin A1C has to do with the fact that your, bot, your red cells will accumulate sugar and it will tell you it will tell the doctor how well you're complying with your diet by it gives you it gives you a number and that number will tell him whether you've been a good boy or a bad boy and if you've been a bad boy then your hemoglobin a1c will be elevated because you ate that damn donut and you knew you weren't supposed to uh, you ate donuts or you went out and had a steak dinner and you know you weren't supposed to eat all that fat. Uh, T-bone steak, we're not talking about, I don't know, what kind of rare meat is there, or meat that has, has very little fat in it. 
Or there are any states that don't have very much fat. Kobe? Kobe B. Yeah, there you go. Japanese. Only the Japanese. Weirdest people in the world. Uh, so that's what your hemoglobin A1C will tell the doctor. He will t it will tell the doctor, over the last two weeks, you've been a good boy or you've been a bad boy, despite the fact that it doesn't really matter what your glucose is. Your glucose is just a, a snapshot. But your hemoglobin A1C is like a movie showing him exactly what you ate over the last two weeks. So if your hemoglobin A1C is elevated, I mean, you can cheat, and people will do this all the time because they're assholes. But people will do this all the time. They will, they, they will be good for, for two days so that their glucose will look good to the doctor, like they're trying to impress the doctor. And the doctor has no clue, unless he draws a hemoglobin A1C. And then he can see what, how much glucose they had over the last two weeks. That's what the hemoglobin A1C does. So it forces them to actually live a good lifestyle. Because I can, I can take, the, it's a movie. It tells me what, what you did over the last two weeks. What? So instead of just taking a snapshot, all of a sudden I've got a two week long movie and I can tell what's going on. That's what hemoglobin A1C is about. Uh, hemoglobin A1C measures good glycemic control over time. <laughs> so now of course we can tell what's going on. So every time you go in you're going to have your glucose taken, but you're also probably going to have your hemoglobin A1C d d drawn, and then the doctor is going to know for sure. Now, the, in the old days, hemoglobin A1C was a lot more expensive to test. You know how important money is. Glucose is cheap, relatively cheap, but a hemoglobin A1C is kind of expensive. It takes a couple days to run one, uh, so that's the way it works. Diabetes can either be a challenge or a death sentence. Diabetes sufferers must manage all aspects of their lives. Lives, they need to control their, their glucose. Uh, they need to eat healthy. <clears throat> they need physical activity. They need to continue physical activity. Now, here's the, here's the kicker. They also need to take care of their food. <coughs> One of the things that happens to you when you have diabetes is you start getting poor circulation. And the poor circulation starts off in your feet. So they have to make sure their feet are okay. They need to run, keep running. They need to keep exercising. They need to do aerobic exercises. That's walking, bicycling, uh, jogging, not running. Running is, too, they run too fast. But they need to take care of their feet. So they need to look at their feet all the time. Uh, if they have a, 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 any damage to their feet, if they have a wound on their feet, it won't heal because they have such poor circulation. One of the reasons that I heal so rapidly is because I have really good circulation. So I heal really fast, which is kind of fun. Because I can hurt myself one day, and that, that hurt will be gone the next day. Taking uh, medicate, me, uh, needed medications, uh, problem solving, that reduces your stress, and active coping with your stress. These are all things that you have to do with diabetes. In 2031, 20% of all uh, Hispanics in the United States will have diabetes. I know. What's going on? Women of Hispanic heritage, Latinas, living in the United States, have a prevalence of uh, type 2 diabetes that is almost twice that found in non-Latina white women. And this is according to the National Center for Health Statistics in 2007. If the current trends continue, over 20%, over 20% of the Latino population overall is expected to have diabetes by 2031. It's because they're short and squat. Those individuals are short and squat. Okay, that's the good news and the bad news. Donald Trump, it makes him happy that they're going to die of diabetes because he doesn't like them. They keep coming across the border and he's trying to build a big wall to keep all those Hispanics out. Those evil Hispanics. They're going to take over our country. <clears throat> cancer. Let's talk about cancer. Cancer is fun. Has anybody ever had cancer? Am I the only one? Oh, jeez. Cancer. Wimps. <laughs> cancer. You're all too way too young to have cancer. So good, good for you. Good, 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 good. Okay. What is cancer? Cancer is a set of diseases 
in which abnormal body cells multiply and spread in uncontrolled fashion, forming a tumor. A tumor. We have these in our bodies all the time. Babies have had cancer cells growing in them. You guys have cancer cells growing in you right now. But your immune systems are so strong that you don't have to worry about it. As you get older, your immune system breaks down. So as you get older, you accumulate more cancer cells. Uh, if you're in a spatial situation, like you're getting becoming uh, getting radiation, uh, if you're in a, to a situation where there's a lot of toxic chemicals, it may distress uh, your immune system, in which case then you may develop a cancer. That's the way it works. If you're one of those idiots that uh, you have really pale skin and you go out in the sun, uh, you're creating um, a situation where you may have cancer cells grow on your skin. And these are known as carcinomas, as much fun as that. I've had three chunks of meat cut off my, my body because they were cancerous chunks of meat. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I had one right here on my neck, I had one right here on my cheek, I think it's a cheek, maybe it's the other cheek. And one of my four, a big chunk of meat. Took an axe. Look at that. Benign cancer cells that are controlled. Uh, these are non cancerous. So if they talk about benign cancer, it means it's non cancerous. It did grow, but your body arrested it. it your immune system took care of it, it encapsulated it. And that's what happened to me. I had, I had skin cancer on my forehead. And it was a big lump, and they just chopped it right out. They said, "Oh, I, we got it all. You don't have to worry about anything." Same thing with my face. Same thing with my neck. I had cancer, cancer, uh, benign cancer growing on my on my skin. Malignant cancer is cancer uh, cells growing unchecked by your immune system, and of course, these are cancerous. These are malignant. Uh, they will continue to grow, and if you don't arrest them, if you don't stop them in one way or another, then now you're going to have a problem. Uh, brain tumors, of course, very difficult <coughs> to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, do, to do surgery on, to cut them out. It was really easy for them to cut off my skin cancer. It was all, they were all skin cells, no problem whatsoever. All taken care of. But if I had a, a tumor in my brain, of course, a lot of times they don't want to go into your brain because they can mess you up, uh, so they would have to leave it. Uh, cancer is the second leading cause of U.S. deaths. <clears throat> Metastases, a uh, process by which malignant body cells proliferate and spread to other parts of the body. Normally, your immune system will arrest them wherever they start growing. If you have liver cancer, uh, it will stay in your liver. If you have brain cancer, a brain tumor, stay in your brain, won't go anyplace else. If you have testicular cancer, it stay in your testes, won't go anyplace else. If you have breast cancer, stays in your breast, doesn't go anyplace else. However, <clears throat> cancers aren't stupid. Cancers will uh, try to protect themselves so that they can spread throughout your body, as stupid as that, or as wonderful as that sounds. And this is known as metastasis. And the way that they protect themselves is the same way that babies grow in a, a mother's uh, womb. Uh, babies are a parasite. They're a pest. They're not supposed to be there. Half of their DNA does not, is not the same as their mother's. So the, the mother's immune system will try to kill them because it, it looks like a cancer it's growing to the mother's immune system. So the babies will protect itself themselves with human chorionic gonadotropin. It tells the mother that this is not, I'm something that's supposed to be there. That's what human chorionic gonadotropin does. Cancers will produce exactly the same stuff, human chorionic gonadotropin. And it will tell the, the person's immune system that this is not an alien structure. This is something that, that should be allowed to live. And then they can move throughout the body. And then they'll grow in your brain, they'll grow in your liver, they'll grow in your lungs. Second autopsy I ever did was a guy that died of lung cancer. And his cancer had metastasized. 
into his liver, into his brain, into his kidneys. And that's what killed him. It wasn't really the lung cancer that killed him. It was all the metastasized cancers. Because they could be treated. His immune system wasn't, trying, wasn't fighting it anymore. So all they could do was try to keep, uh, knock it out with chemotherapy. And it didn't work. And in this case, we cut into that guy, we pulled out all of his organs, and by God, he had black spots all over the place. He had black spots on, on his rib cage. He had cancer growing on his rib He was a mess. There was a, yeah, a smelter, too. You know? Had something to that one? Yeah. My sister had a, when she was uh, pregnant, uh, she had a cancer growing at the same time. Oh. And uh, she had a good ending because of when the baby came out, the cancer came out with progressive Are you kidding? Yeah. Was it endometrial cancer? So, like, hitting the two birds with one stone. Was the baby okay? Yeah. Baby's fine. Okay. She's fine. This, I think, sort of rural stuff like allergies or would be allergic to a certain products. Isn't that interesting? Autoimmune diseases. Isn't that fascinating? So the cancer came out with the baby, yeah. which is... is <laughs> We, so won't we, even, we, we won't go, even the way go you said that, it, it, you know, how it, it coons up and, right. and how it's alienated from the, the fetus and right. inside the womb is separated right. and crushed out. Wow, that's amazing. That's really amazing. Because my sister died of endometrial cancer. Yeah, she had, a, she had a chance of not making it. It was sort of the baby. Yeah. Yeah. The cancer could have overtaken the baby, but it couldn't get into the placenta, I'm guessing. Wow. <clears throat> Interesting story. Carcinoma is a cancer of the epithelial cells that link the outer and inner surfaces of the body. One in six people in the United States have a carcinoma. Uh, breast cancer uh, tends to be a carcinoma. Prostate cancer is a carcinoma. Lung cancer is a uh, carcinoma. Skin cancer, of course, what I was talking about. Those are all, you're covered with epithelial cells. Your colon is covered with epithelial cells. So if you get colon cancer, it's epithelial, it's a carcinoma, uh, or uh, carcinoma in your pancreas. These are all epithelial cells. Most of your, the cells in your body are epithelial cells. Also, <coughs> anything that is covering something, anything that is exposed is uh, epithelial cells. So your bladder, the inside of your bladder, epithelial cells. The inside of your, uh, of your intestines, epithelial cells. Uh, sarcoma is uh, cancer that strikes muscles, bones, and cartilage. 2% of cancers are sarcomas. Uh, carcinomas are far more uh, easy to uh, treat. Car uh, carcinomas. Because they're on the surface of something. And so they're much easier to treat. Sarcomas, on the other hand, uh, they invade muscles, uh, bones, and cartilage. Uh, if that happens, of course, you have to cut that part out. Uh, you may have to amputate somebody's leg or arm or whatever. As odd as that may seem. Uh, there was a baseball player, and he got a sarcoma in his pitching arm. And one day, I, this is a horror, it's an ugly, it's, you can see the tape on, on uh, the internet. One day he was pitching, and uh, his bone snapped. His arm snapped. I know. It's the most... And I was watching that game. It was a Saturday. It was a Saturday ball game, and and the guy had just come back from his treatment, and everything was fine, and they cleared him a pitch, and so he's pitching, and he had just struck somebody out, and the next pitch he threw, when he's left-handed, and he threw the ball, and his arm just snapped it was right up here. It snapped, and it just folded back. It was the ugliest thing you've ever seen, and of course he was in a great deal of pain. And here I am laughing about it. So. There you go. That's how cruel I am. Anyway, he had a sarcoma in his bone. They had to amputate his arm. Uh, it had weakened his uh, the bones in his uh, the uh, the knitting in his bone so so much that they had to amputate his arm. Lymphoma is cancer of the body's lymph system. It includes Hodgkin's disease and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Some four thousand seventy-four thousand four hundred ninety people were diagnosed with lymphoma in 2009. Leukemia is cancer of the blood and blood producing uh, system. So we have all those different types of uh, cancers, carcinoma, sarcoma, lymphoma, and uh, leukemia. 
Many individual factors such as gender, age, and ethnicity affect susceptibility to cancers. Uh, the older people become, the uh, greater their chances of developing and dying of a cancer, and it's mainly because of your immune system. It's your immune system that keeps you from dying from cancer when you're born. So your immune system is constantly knocking this stuff out. So you can thank your lucky immune system uh, that you haven't died of cancer yet. The prevalence of different cancers varies by age, by age group. One in two men will develop a cancer in their lifetime, and I've already developed my cancer, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. That's not true. Once you develop a cancer, you're more likely to develop, to develop a second cancer. 28% uh, of all cancers diagnosed in men is prostate cancer. This is a really serious problem, prostate cancer. And I can give you a, I can tell you how not to get prostate cancer. Don't contract gonorrhea. There you go. Don't contract any sexually transmitted infection. All right. There's another way to do it, but I won't tell you. I'll tell you when all the, the young ladies are gone. A way to keep from getting prostate cancer. 28% uh, of all deaths from cancer are lung and bronchus uh, cancer, though they represent only 14% of diagnose, diagnosed cancers. Uh, one in three women will develop a cancer in their lifetime. Uh, remember, women are protected from cancer as long as they are ovulating. As soon as they stop ovulating, all bets are off. Uh, men and women should have the same uh, level of cancers, but for the first 40 or 50 years of a woman's life, she's protected from it, so she only contracts cancer after she goes through menopause. Then she's, her body looks more like a man's body, and of course she, she has all that delicate tissue that uh, she can develop cancer in. Uh, women's bodies have a lot more delicate tissue, the cervix, uh, the uterus, uh, the breast tissue are all very delicate tissue. Specialized tissue for specialized things. It's, uh, there's the specialized tissue uh, to produce children and to feed children. This is all very specialized tissue and because of that uh, they're more likely to develop uh, endometrial cancer, uh, to develop cervical cancer, or develop breast cancer. As it turns out, uh, breast cancer is very common in women. 29% will have, uh, of, of all cancers diagnosed in women, is breast cancer. And this is one of the reasons why we have, um, uh, why, why we are uh, doing what we're doing to, to fight breast cancer. So the two biggest killers in the United States well, that turns out that that's not true. The biggest killer in the United States is lung cancer. The bi biggest cancer killer in the United States is lung cancer in both men and women. 26% of all deaths from cancer are lung and bronchus uh, cancer, though they represent only 14% of cancers diagnosed. So for both men and women, it's lung cancer is the biggest killer. More women will come down with breast cancer, but they'll be treated and they'll survive. More men come down with prostate cancer, but they'll be treated and they'll survive. Uh, there are ways, there are things you could do with uh, prostate cancer. You can cut it out. You can cut the prostate out. Uh, you can treat it with radiation. Uh, men do die of prostate cancer. Women do die of breast cancer, but they're less likely to die of that than lung cancer. The problem with lung cancer is it's also specialized tissue. But the problem, problem with lung cancer is that it metastasizes so readily. <clears throat> and that's the biggest problem. That's why so many people die of lung cancer. In the United States, cancer is the second leading cause of death among children between the ages of 1 and 14 after accidents. And of course, that is a tragedy in itself. So why are these children coming down with cancer? Well, the reason they're coming down with cancer is because they're immunocompromised in one way or another. The immune system isn't working properly. The only reason to come down with a cancer is your immune system. However, here's the beauty of cancers. If you have a cancer, and it was benign cancer, then your body, it was your immune system that kept it from be, becoming malignant. So your, your immune system was able to encapsulate it. It was able to stop it where it was. And then it became a, a, a benign tumor that could be cut out. 
but it was your immune system that did that. So the three cancers that I've had, the three skin cancers that I've had, my body stopped them from going anywhere else. My immune system did. So potentially I was under a lot of stress, which caused me to have the cancer to begin with, but then the stress went away and my immune system took over and it stopped the cancer from growing, going any farther. That's the beauty of your immune system. It stops things and it won't let it go any farther. If I had kept that tumor on my forehead, not had it cut off, it would still be exactly the same because my body had already encapsulated it. It already arrested it. It could, didn't have any place else to go. And I'd have this big lump on my forehead, which is always attractive. It looked like a horn. <laughs> African Americans have the highest incidence rate of cancer in the United States. Any idea why African Americans are so cancerous? What is it about African Americans that makes them so cancerous? Makes them so susceptible to cancer? African Americans. Stress. 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 Yeah. The United States is dominated by white people. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Living on the reservation, all you see are natives. But the reality is, if you go out, if you go to Phoenix, you go to I don't know, Denver, you go to Chicago, you're going to run into a lot of white people. White people have not liked black people for a long time. <clears throat> this is a, a reality. They only represent, what, 11% of the population? So there aren't that many. Uh, so there's a lot of prejudice out there. There's a lot of danger if you're black. You can't walk down the road, especially if there's a lot of white people around them. You might get shot by a policeman, whether you're armed or not. So this is something that, uh, that African Americans think about all the time unfortunately. So there's a lot of prejudice. And that's why they're so susceptible to cancers. African American women historically have been less likely to perform regular breast cancer screening. Uh, so what is regular breast cancer screening? What do you have to do to, in order to screen yourself for breast cancer? How do you do that? Well, the men don't know. They don't have breasts. They don't have a clue about a check for breast cancer. How do you check for bre breast cancer? Self-examination. I'm sorry? Self-examination. Self-examination? What does that mean? Check yourself. Check yourself. So what do you do? Feel what are you looking for? Feel for lumps. You're looking for lumps. Sorry. Yeah, they're looking for lumps. And you have to manipulate the, uh, the breast tissue and, and feel for a hard place, for a lump. My second wife had had, had uh, lumps in her breasts that had to be taken out, strangely enough. Isn't that um, all? You're not supposed to be in this class. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what you had to say anything. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, that's called um, fibro... 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 No, no. Fibromyalgia is something. Um, what is it called? Fibros... But you have... Uh, no, I can't think of it. I forgot what it was I can't think of it either. See, now you're causing me to <laughs> feel like I'm stupid. Or painted or anything. Yeah. No, there, there are, you get uh, fibrous uh, areas in your, in your breast. You have to have Well, you don't have to have As long as they're not a malignant. Well, if you do find a lump in your breast, they, they won't just go in with a scalpel and chop the sucker out. That's not what's going to happen. They'll, first, they'll take a biopsy to make sure it's not malignant. That those cells out of it. And they'll find out if it's malignant. None of hers were malignant. Uh, last time I talked to her, I haven't talked to her. <coughs> I haven't talked to her since '99, I think, 2000. She's my second wife. You're not supposed to communicate with your ex-wives, are you? You are. Oh my God! I'll call her tonight. <laughs> That's dangerous. Yeah, I know. You guys are trying to get me divorced or something. <laughs> I had, a student, used, I had a student at Ashford that, that claimed she was going to be my fourth wife. Uh, she's pregnant, so I'm not exactly sure if I want to marry somebody that's pregnant with somebody else's kid. So I, I'm not going to force my wife to do it. It's kind of a joke. <clears throat> she's like 23, and she wants to be my fourth wife. And I'm like 100, 123, so <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all. <clears throat> 
After, okay, so African American women don't check themselves. African Americans uh, tend to have less access to health insurance and health care facilities. This has been a tragedy in the United States. One of the reasons that they passed the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, you guys don't have to worry about it, but do you worry about your African American brothers and sisters? Do you? Or do you not give a shit? Do you care about them? Hell no. Why, why would you care about the black people? That's a problem with white people. They don't care about black people any either. And so a lot of them were on Medicaid, and Medicaid, or some of them were on Medicaid. A lot more white people on Medicaid than black people on Medicaid. Uh, but uh, this is one of the reasons why they pack, passed the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, so that Af the African Americans who were working but weren't making enough money or didn't have the health insurance at their job could get insurance. They could get rel relatively low-cost insurance. Uh, 18 million Americans were added to the insurance uh, uh, ledgers when, uh, when they passed the Affordable Care Act. A lot of them were African Americans. So they still have to pay for they, Yeah, but they're, they're working, so it's, it's not very expensive. It's not as expensive for them. <clears throat> At least they have the insurance now. Whereas before, they were... What's SOL stand for? Out of luck. Out of luck, that's right, they're out of luck. <laughs> they were out of luck. Ethnic differences in diet play a role. African Americans tend to consume fattier diets because they, just like you guys, if you, if you want to eat someplace and you don't want to drive all the way to Chinle or Gallup or Farmington, you go down to the gas station over here and eat that really greasy food, right? Isn't that all they have, greasy food? Uh, same way with African Americans. African Americans tend to live in uh, ur urban areas. Uh, those areas have just as crappy of uh, grocery stores as you guys do. <coughs> How many grocery stores are there on the Navajo Reservation? I say four. I think there's. Six. No, there's five now since they opened the one over by Ganado. In that town just before you get to Ganado? Uh, Burnside? Yeah. Is it Burnside? Is it Burnside? They have a grocery store, and that was number five. This is a big, big place. If I have to drive all the way to Chinle to get groceries at some of the grocery stores, um, then, you know. That yeah. only lasts for about two days, and they start to turn. Then, then you have to go to the gas station and get whatever they've got. What do they have over there? Well, they got all the hot Junk Cheetos, food. exactly, hot Cheetos that you want. <laughs> and Red, Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> slushy. Yeah, slushies. Do they have slushies over there? That's all we need to survive. Slushies and hot Cheetos. Uh, okay. African Americans uh, have 60% greater chance of contracting cancer than other minorities in the United States, and that includes you guys. Now, why in the world do you guys not contract cancer at the same rate that they do? What's, what's so good about you guys? How come you don't get cancer like the African Americans do? I'm sorry? Why? Why? Why don't you get cancer like they do? 60% greater chance of contracting cancer than any other minority in the United States. So what's going on here? How come you guys don't get cancer? No, there's no stress. There's no prejudice against American Indians. None whatsoever. Is that it? No stress? You're stressless? Except you got a damn paper to write. Not you, I already, I'm already grading your paper right now. The rest of you got, not you, I already graded your paper. It was a good one. Thank you, it was a good paper. Sharon, I've already read Sharon's paper. Was that, yeah, it had to be in this class, is the only question about it. Okay. Sharon's good, Steve's good. Uh, Francis is good. The rest of you guys will be a, a paper. You will be a paper for the last class. You will be a Oh, 241. Okay. I sent my Yeah. <laughs> it's in the mail. <laughs> it's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so why do African Americans suffer from cancer more than you guys do? What's so good about you guys? Besides the fact you're not under any stress whatsoever. Is there anything else? Any other reason that you would not suffer from cancer like they do? Because you have IHS 
Indian Health Service. And it may be the worst health service in the United States, but it's better than nothing. And it is not that good. It's the same one that the military has. Their health service is the same. They get their doctors from the same place. <clears throat> Uh, African American males have a high rate of lung and prostate cancer. African Americans are 33% more likely to die of cancer than European Americans, and that's because of health care. They don't have the same health care. Here we go. 28% of the, the most likely uh, cancer uh, for a man to get is prostate cancer. Uh, and coming in second place is lung cancer. Coming in third place is colon and rectal cancer. Uh, urinary cancer is number four. Melanoma, that's uh, that's a form of skin cancer, is number five. Is number five. Number six is kidney cancer. Uh, number four is Hodgkin's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, th uh, Three percent of the cancers in men uh, have to do with their mouths, oral and their pharynx. Has to do with smoking either cigarettes or pot. Pot is just as carcinogenic as tobacco is. Leukemia, 3%. Pancreatic cancer, 3%. This is because of, of drinking, of course, and all other sites, 14%. Women most likely to get breast cancer because it's very delicate tissue. 14% uh, lung cancer and bronchitis, uh, just like men. Uh, colon, colorectal cancer, 9% uh, uterine cancer. 6% uh, that's what your sister had, uterine corpus uh, cancer. 6% uh, thyroid cancer that we don't see in men. Any, any idea of why women have thyroid cancer and men don't have thyroid cancer? Any ideas? You're doing something else. Don't think about this. Hi. I'm going to take this class during the summer. So. Oh, okay. Oh, you're going to take the suit. That yeah. would be She's a lot more fun than I. I swear, I'll. she matters. Except at me. <laughs> thyroid, thyroid, thyroid. Um, thyroid uh, controls your basal metabolism rate. Women, of course, have that hormonal shift uh, that takes place all through their their uh, their monthly their monthly uh, hormonal changes, and because of that, thyroid becomes involved. And that's one of the reasons why they have more thyroid cancer. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, 4%. Melanoma, the skin, 4%, uh, which is a little bit less than men. And that's because traditionally women didn't spend as much time in the sun as men did. Uh, ovarian cancer, 3%. Kidney and uh, renal pelvis, uh, 3%. Pancreas, 3%. And all other sites, 19%. But when we talk about deaths, for both males and females, 28% uh, lung cancer, 26% uh, lung cancer for women, it's lung cancer that kills everybody. Whether you're a boy or a girl, it's going to be, if you die of a cancer, it's most likely to be lung cancer. Lung cancer is the killer. Prostate cancer with men, 28%. Uh, breast cancer with women, 28%. Yet they don't die from breast cancer. They don't die from prostate cancer. They die of lung cancer. Uh, prostate cancer is number two for men, 10% for women, breast cancer, 14%. Uh, colon, colorectal cancer, 9%. Um, if you are a music fan, Dusty Springfield died of uh, breast cancer at age 50. At age 50. Dusty Springfield. Does anybody know? Francis is probably the only one that's ever heard of Dusty Springfield, and you haven't ever heard of okay. Dusty Springfield. In the, she was the 60s, 60s uh, late 60s, early 70s. So. Uh, pancreatic cancer, ovarian, uh, well, anyway, you can see all the rest of them. The most important thing is lung cancer is the big killer for both boys and girls. Uh, epidemiologists estimate that even if we live in a world uh, where all environmental carcinogens could be avoided, 25% of the cancers develop, developing now would develop anyway. So we, even if we could get rid of all carcinogens, all the toxins in the world, if we could get rid of all the tobacco, the alcohol, all these poisons we put in our bodies, we'd still be dying of cancer. They're constantly being developed in our bodies. Uh, these cancers would develop because of uncontrollable genetic factors and biological processes that are taking place. So we'd still have 25% of the cancers that we have today, even if we could get rid of all carcinogens. 
Carcinogen is a cancer-causing agent such as tobacco, ultraviolet radiation, or an environmental toxin. Uh, tobacco use is implicated in one of every five deaths in the United States. 20% of all deaths are caused by tobacco. That's a good reason not only for you not to smoke anything, uh, but it's also a good reason to stay away from people who smoke. Don't kiss them. Don't stick your tongue in their mouth. I'm trying to help. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Steve. No, I'll tell you what. I had a girlfriend one time that was a smoke. Well, it's like it was like kissing an ash. It's like licking an ashtray. I swear. And she was she was she was gorgeous. But it was like licking an ashtray. You can write that one down if you like. Bradway said, kissing your girl who smokes is like licking an ashtray. I like licking an ashtray. It's somebody urinated in. <laughs> urinated in. <laughs> Who's out there? Am I in trouble? Okay. Oh, there's some like new faces. <laughs> Tobacco is the single most lethal carcinogen known to man. And you, where did we get it? We got it from you guys. Thank you so very much for all the tobacco. Yeah, uh, can it, can it. Mountain tobacco. Call it anything you want. It doesn't matter. It's still really nasty stuff. Most tobacco-related deaths result uh, from cancer. Tobacco use is also linked to the cancers of the mouth, the pharynx, the larynx, the esophagus. Uh, the pancreas, the uterus, the cervix, the kidney, and the bladder. So it goes throughout your system. <clears throat> uh, Sigmund Freud, the great psychologist, uh, had cancer of the jaw. And they had to take his jaw, his bottom jaw out. You can imagine somebody without a bottom jaw. Anyway, he had a prosthetic that they would put in. And he could talk with his thing. But he said it hurt like the devil. He hated it. Uh, so why did he get cancer of the jaw? He got cancer of the jaw because he used to smoke cigars. He, said. he always had a cigar hanging out of his mouth. Because it's, it was what men did. This is how you prove that you were masculine, was by smoking a cigar or a pipe. Or chewing tobacco. I think, uh, we do the dumbest things just to prove the same thing. I think it was the early ages where men would work outside. And I don't admire the people that do. They need to wear a mask, but they do wear a mask, but it's so the stuff won't pop up into their eyes. Anyway, tobacco. So thanks a lot for the tobacco. We gave you alcohol in, in exchange. I don't know who won. Evidently, you guys did. You're killing off a lot more people with your tobacco than we are with our alcohol. And here we go. This should make you happy. The little white kids smoky cigarettes. <laughs> a recent poll showed that a graduating sen seniors, 42.2%, have tried tobacco and 10.7% report smoking every day. Uh, often the de deciding factor in adolescent smoking is whether the parents of the teens smoke. Uh, research shows, seems to show that if the parent quits smoking, before the child reaches the third grade, the individual is less likely to see the behavior as acceptable. And I guess that's for those of you who smoke and you have children. <clears throat> because uh, children are young and their brains are not fully developed, peer influence and identity formation are key factors in tobacco experimentation. Uh, just as adolescents identify with those who uh, they socialize with, Particular behaviors can become internalized as a personality identifier throughout their life. Those of us who are nerds, how many of us are nerds? Do we have any nerds in the room? Am I the only damn? Oh, me and Travis, okay, there we go. We're, we're like brothers of the nerd. Nerd brothers. <laughs> athletes, any athletes in the room? No, am I the only one? Okay. Stoners, any stoners in the room? Nobody? Okay. How about brainiacs? Oh, stoners, there we go. Travis again. Okay. 
And brainiacs, I guess all of us should raise our hand with the brainiac. Once again, because of the immature adolescent brain, teens are more teens are more susceptible to the addictive properties of tobacco than people who wait till they are 21 to try the substance. Thus, adolescents who start smoking are more likely to become regular smokers because they're stupid teenage kids. Uh, this is true of alcohol as well. If you don't start drinking alcohol until you're 21, the probability of you becoming an alcoholic is fairly remote. But we've got all this pressure from our friends. I was lucky. I didn't have any friends when I was in school, so I didn't, I didn't start drinking or smoking because I didn't have anybody going, oh, only cool people smoke. You know, you're not cool unless you smoke. I didn't have that person. Thank God. <clears throat> I didn't run with a cool crowd. I didn't run with any crowd. Nobody wanted, nobody wanted to walk with me. <laughs> I was all by myself. Diet is, a sec is second only to tobacco as a carcinogen. One third of all cancer deaths are attributed to poor diet choices, types of food eaten, the, how the food is prepared, uh, size of portions, whether the diet is balanced, uh, calorie intake. All of these things can influence whether you get cancer or not. What are we talking about? We're talking about eating that deep fat fried shit that they've got over here at the gas station. I don't care what it is, burritos. Who? Who fries a burrito? Why in the world would anybody deep fat fry a burrito? Why would they do? Chimichangas are good though. I'm sorry? I said chimichangas are good though. Chimichangas are good, but do they deep fat? Well, I guess they do, but yeah, they do it right. I don't know. I'm addicted to it. Chimichangas are good. Yeah, there you go. Smothered in guacamole, which theoretically is good for you. So there we go. We're, we're taking out all the bad stuff. Uh, by putting all that guacamole on the top. <laughs> it's avocados. Avocados have a lot of fat. So the way you prepare your food, the types of food that you eat, uh, if you eat, if you supersize everything, of course McDonald's was doing this to everybody for, I don't know, a number of years, and they were proving that uh, they were killing uh, people in the United States. Not that they cared, because they made more money. It's always the money to break it down. Money is the most important part. <laughs> Greed. Cancer is more prevalent among people who are malnourished, consume high levels of fats, consume certain food additives such as nitrates in processed meats. And this is kind of scary because I love hot dogs. However, comma, if you eat hot dogs, there's nitrates in it. More nitrate, there's more nitrates in jerky, damn it. Especially the stuff you find in a package. If it's fresh jerky, then you're probably okay. But if you're buying those packages of jerky stuff, the, the amount of nitrates in them is very, very high. Smoked sausage, hot dogs, oh my god, these are all my favorite foods. Oh, too much fat. Anyway. Uh, if you go to Germany and you eat sausage in Germany, they're always freshly prepared. Not so much uh, nitrates. Uh, alcohol is another uh, uh, food that can cause a problem. Uh, diets can reduce the possibility of cancer, reduce intake of foods and drinks that promote weight gain, uh, eat, taking in saturated fats, sugary <coughs> drinks like Mountain Dew, which I drink way too many of, the red stuff, not the green stuff. Or is it yellow stuff? It's yellow. Uh, eat primarily uh, plant-based foods. Uh, limit intake of red meat and avoid processed meats. Uh, limit that's that includes ham, by the way. <clears throat> uh, especially the way they make it now. In the old days, they used to take a they used to butcher a hog, and then they take all the parts that potentially they didn't want to eat as fresh pork, and they'd hang it in a smokehouse and they'd smoke it. Now, of course, in order for them to create them, uh, they treat it. And what, they, what do they treat it with? They treat it with nitrates, of course. So even hams are, uh, are, aren't good for you. In the old days, of course, this was really good meat. And it was always good for you. And, it could, and you could save it for an extended length of time. But now they, they cheat. They put stuff in it. They inject it with nitrates in order to maintain it. That's just... 
sad, sad, a sad, sad story for you. The limit consumption of alcoholic beverages, of course, it's a toxin and it destroys your pancreas. It destroys your liver, I'm sorry. Uh, reduce intake of salt and moldy grains or legumes. Uh, okay, so you need to reduce your, the amount of salt that you take in and uh, select uh, plants. Uh, don't eat moldy bread. I had, uh, I had some bread that turned moldy over the weekend. So I threw it outside for the dogs and they, all, they ate it. I don't know. Now they're all dead. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is what a dog's digestive system looks like. It's a straight tube to their butt, okay? So when they eat something, it, they barely, it barely goes through their stomach. They either, if it's bad, they either vomit it or they shoot it out and diarrhea. But dog's digestive system is very simple. Anyway, <clears throat> so nobody died. Uh, possible, not even my dog. I fed my dog that stuff too. Possible food like, what is it? It's aspergillus, right? Should that kill a dog? Aspergillus? It's fungus. The green stuff on, on bread. Aspergillus. We can eat it, okay? There's, there's no reason why we can't eat it. Possible food links to certain cancers are those that affect the cells that line bodily tissues, including those in the lungs, the colon, the bladder, the stomach, and the rectum. To a lesser degree, the uterus, the prostate, breasts, and, uh, and kidneys. So the closer they come to the food that you eat, the more likely that they will cause cancers. So if it's in your digestive system, then now we've got a problem. Okay, let's talk about soybeans. Uh, you guys don't know anything about soybeans, but I live in Iowa where they grow like all the soybeans in the world. I live in a soybean field, okay? Sometimes it's a cornfield. This year it's a soybean field. They grow a lot of soybeans, and they sell most of them to China, except not this year because we have a tariff on China. We're having a tariff war with the Chinese. Uh, soy food contains isoflavones, uh, which can act as estrogens in the body. These are known as phytoestrogens. Okay, so those of you who drink soy milk, if you're a girl, don't worry about it. Well, yes, you still should worry about it. If you're a boy, all of a sudden you're going to start growing breast tissue, which is always attractive to them. Boobs on a man, is all, they're always attractive. Man boobs, they call them man boobs. Okay. <laughs> the degree of difference between naturally occurring estrogen and phytoestrogen is significant, but the added estrogen to women could increase the level of estrogen to a carcinogenic level. And this is one of the reasons why you should limit the amount of soy that you take in. Some women are lactose intolerant, so they drink soy milk instead. And if they do that, this can be a problem. This can be a really serious problem. They can increase their estrogen level to the point of uh, causing uh, cervical or uterine cancer, and this is, or breast cancer. This is not good news. So you need to be careful about how much of this stuff you're taking in have to be really careful about how much of this stuff you're taking in. It wasn't more than 10 years ago that we didn't know this, so we were telling women to eat this stuff, and it made you sexier. Well, yeah, it made you sexier, but then you came down with breast cancer, and then you died. Whoops. Uh, for a while, we were thinking that we could treat uh, the effects of menopause with, uh, with estrogen therapy, and that worked, except they were dying of uterine and cervical cancer and breast cancer. This is not good news. Doctors aren't, don't always know what the hell they're talking about. And this was one situation where we didn't. We made a mistake and we were feeding people soy stuff and we were killing them. <laughs> anyway, so be careful as to how much of this stuff you take in. It's especially true of uh, breast cancer. Don't drink the soy milk if you're a girl. Don't drink the soy milk if you're a boy, unless you're, you decided you want to be transgender. It works. <laughs> it's too much fun. Uh, car carotenoids are light absorbing pigments that give vegetables their color. It's the reason that carrots are orange. It's the reason that tomatoes are red. 
It's a reason the pumpkins are orange. It's a reason that broccoli is green. It's a reason that cauliflower has a has a uh, is an off-white color. Brussels sprouts, of course, are green. Uh, citrus fr fruits, especially oranges, are orange, and lemons are, are yellow, uh, and limes are green. Strawberries, of course, are red, and that's the reason. It's because of the carotenoids, that they have all of these colors. Uh, carotenoids are rich in antioxidants, especially beta carotene, which is a good source of vitamin A. Uh, so eating these foods is a really good idea, eating these vegetables. Carrots, cauliflower, any of the crucifers, uh, citrus fruits. Uh, I have half a lemon in my lemonade. Uh, healthy stuff. Uh, what I have for breakfast? V8 juice. I have V8 juice for breakfast. That would make you vomit. <clears throat> not you, not me, but you. What? Well, uh, uh. Protective foods, garlic, onions, and leeks uh, protect from breast and stomach cancer. Uh, strangely enough, <clears throat> in Europe, of course, they didn't have potatoes until, until they came over here. Uh, they, they got the potatoes from the South Americans. Um, and then they moved the potatoes over there and they started eating potatoes. But the question is, what did they eat before? What did you put on your table before you had potatoes? before you had french fries and mashed potatoes. Guess what they put on their table? Onions, that's why we stink so much. Europeans onions. <laughs> they eat onions. They used to eat onions by the bushel load. Selenium rich foods, uh, fish, liver, garlic, uh, eggs, whole, whole grains, they protect you from prostate cancer if you're a guy, if you're a female, don't worry about it. Flavonoids uh, are in red wine, grapes, apples, and cranberries. It reduce the risk of lung and colorectal cancer. Uh, for lunch, I'm going to have two apples. All those flavonoids. I'm protecting myself from colorectal cancer. Lycopene uh, is in tomatoes, red peppers, and watermelon. It contains antioxidants and aids in co uh, cognition. Makes you smart. Eating watermelon makes you smart. <clears throat> Maybe that's my problem. I had spaghetti for supper last night, uh, tomato sauce. Uh, indoles, uh, cruci cruciferous vegetables reduce the risk of several forms of cancer. Cruciferous vegetables are really good for you, but a lot of people don't like the, ta the flavor. It tastes like cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, they're all cruci crucifers. So the cruciferous uh, vegetables are, are very, very good for you. The cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. The things that, uh, that uh, people don't like. They don't like the flavor of uh, Brussels sprouts. Too strong. Excessive drinking is a major risk factor for cancer of the, of the upper respiratory and digestive tracts. Excessive drinking may also contribute to breast, uh, colorectal and liver cancer. Uh, consuming two or more alcoholic drinks per day creates an in, uh, at least 25% greater risk of breast cancer in women. Now you wonder, what the hell does alcohol have to do with your breasts? <clears throat> We're not exactly sure, but we do know that it does increase your probability of breast cancer. Animal research shows that drinking the equivalent of two to four drinks per day increases the growth of existing tumors, and of course, that's, well, what is that? That's four cans of beer. I mean, who can sit down with a six-pack and not drink the whole damn thing? It's a joke and nobody got it. Okay, good. <laughs> Lack of physical activity may be a risk factor for colon cancer in both men and women. Regular exercise, whether working related or recreational, may protect women from breast cancer. Uh, so whether you're doing housework or whether you're wandering around the mall, uh, you're protecting yourself from breast cancer. Seven hours or more of exercise a week makes breast cancer 20% less likely. Walking works as well as more strenuous exercise. You don't have to jog. You can just walk or ride your bicycle or whatever. Uh, physically active women have lower rates of breast cancer than do sedentary women. Uh, just a, something to think about. Being overweight and obese increases risk of cancer. In the endometrium, the colon, the, the kidney, the esophagus, the pancreas, the ovaries, and the gallbladder. 
In 2012, the CDC reported that 34% of U.S. adults are overweight, 35.9% are obese. Uh, exact causal uh, mechanisms are not known. Uh, so why in the world would all this be true? Um, why in the world uh, would exercise have something to do with, with all of these diseases? Like colon cancer. What is, what is this about colon cancer? What causes colon cancer? It's, it's still on. Shit. Yeah. You don't move that stuff through your body, it's, it sits in one place, and all of a sudden you've got an abnormal, uh, you got abnormal cells developing. That's it. You gotta move this stuff through your system. You've gotta replace all this stuff on a continuous basis. This is one of the reasons why when we put people in nursing homes, they die. They die because they're not moving anymore. They don't have anything to do. This is one of the reasons why the good nursing homes are the ones that get them up and make them move their arms and whatever. These are the individuals uh, that uh, will live for a couple more years because they're moving that stuff through their, their system. They have to feed them every day. If they don't feed them, of course, then it doesn't produce any feces. But if they don't feed them, they're not, they're not uh, repairing their, their cells. So you've got to do this. I like that. Uh, previous, you know, previous employment, there was, there was a correction facility where most guys and ladies... You worked there. Where you worked. Work. Yeah. <coughs> they, would, um, they wouldn't... They're too shy to use the restaurant. So they went yeah. in front of people. Sure. And then the food was... Not what they used to. Sure. And more sodium in it than they used to. Store it up and also be sent to the front Sure. It, it happened in the military too. <clears throat> when, we, when I first got to Vietnam, we had to take a dump in a bucket of creosote. It was a barrel that had been cut off. So you had to lean over and, and defecate inside this barrel of creosote. And it was creosote. So, I mean, once you deposited your waste, it went to the bottom, theoretically. But the bottom of the creosote kept it from contaminating anything else. Well, there are a lot of people that couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle it. They were used to toilets. They were used to toilet seats. So, and this was a really serious problem. So these guys got locked up. Wow. So what do you do? Well, you give them laxatives, hoping that it scoots it, scoots it through their body. But if not, you have to send them back. And they have to have surgery to take that shit out of their bodies. This is not a pleasant thing. I have, when I worked in, in the clinic, one, of, one thing I had to do was if a lady became impacted, or a guy became impacted, you had to reach in there and try to pull the stuff out. And it was usually as hard as a brick. And, and it was thick. So, I mean, it was not something that you would pass through your anus very comfortably. But you had to stick your hand in there and pull the stuff out. That was not my favorite job. That's one of the closest to the, my least favorite job, is sticking my hand in somebody's rectum trying to pull out the, their feces. I never even told people. <laughs> your congratulations, you're the only people I've told it's about. All it's on and it's on tape, so everybody's gonna all the all the well all the old women that I pulled their shit out of their ass are all dead and they're all dead. Yeah, you picked the wrong day to <laughs> Man, did you ever pick the wrong day to say class? Okay. And this is what she looked like. No, I, uh, there we go. Usually she was obese. That was a problem. And usually there was something stre stressful happening in her life. That happened as well. And of course, at the time, I wasn't, couldn't act as a, as a psychologist. I could only act as a nurse, so I, I really couldn't talk to the person to figure out what was going on. Postmenopause obese women have a 1.5 <coughs> times higher risk of cancer than their normal weight sisters. Uh, being overweight as the, you wander into middle age increases your risk of early mortality by 20 to 40 percent. You need to exercise. You need, need to eat correctly. You don't, and this is what happens to you. Your hair turns white. Your skin turns pale. I'm just trying to scare people. <laughs> and you turn into a fat white lady. That's what happens to you. 
95% of breast cancer causes, causes cases are non-genetic or due to other risk factors. Uh, Angelina Jolie has a genetic proclivity for breast cancer. She has uh, cancer in her reproductive organs in her family. There is cancer in their reproductive organs. There is a genetic proclivity for this. We know what that gene is. And Angelina Jolie has that gene. And because she has that gene, she has had a double mastectomy, taking both of her breasts off, and she's had a hysterectomy, so she can't reproduce anymore. But she, and she's hoping that this protects her from cancer in the future, breast cancer or ovarian cancer or uterine cancer. So hopefully she'll live for a long time. But she's had by, so she's had her ovaries taken out. Now what does this do? Well, she's not producing her own estrogen anymore, so she has to get something. So she's taking estrogen supplement. Now the interesting thing is going to be to see how she reacts to this, to see how long she lives. So, mm -hmm. we're, we're on a death watch for Angelina Jolie. We're trying to find, figure out when she's going to when she's going to croak. Now the interesting thing is she just divorced Brad Pitt. Isn't that correct? Did she just divorced Brad Pitt. I think she just did. Okay. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see if anybody else marries her. She's had all of her female parts taken out. <clears throat> she doesn't have. She's not producing her own estrogen. She's taking estrogen replacement therapy. So the question. There's lots of questions. Well, one of the questions is: Does she still feel like she's a female? That ought to be. Interesting. Remember, uh, she became famous because she played Laura Croft, the Tomb Raider, who, of course, the cartoon of Laura Croft was fairly extreme, kind of an interesting individual bouncing around mm -hmm. through all the, all the tombs and whatnot. So this should be interesting to see how uh, Angelina Jolie reacts to this, to see if she gets married again, See if she if they keep giving her these roles where she's um, a very attractive female. I I haven't seen her since her mm -hmm. surgery, so I'm not sure. I'm sure she's had reconstructive surgery and uh, given herself bre uh, They've given her breast implants, chest, you know, chest implants. I'm, I'm sure breast implants. So she still looks like a female, but whether she f still feels like a female is is kind of an interesting question. Uh, so what are we doing? 95% of all breast cancer cases are non-genetic. Hers was, of course. Um, the risk factors, obesity, minarchy at a young age. In other words, they started having their period when they were very, very young. Uh, this is really kind of interesting. I was talking to my mother the, before she died, and uh, my mother and I used to talk about all kinds of stuff because we were both medical people. Uh, so she'd say just about anything to me. Uh, and she said that she started her period when she was 16. And she said most of the girls in her class started when they were 14. But women are starting now in the third grade, in the fourth grade. They're starting their periods much, much younger than they ever have before. This is something that we're seeing. Uh, so potentially, this is, a, this is a risk factor for breast cancer, early minarchy. <clears throat> as curious as that is. So we'll see how this progresses. We'll keep watching it as we're watching to see when Angelina Jolie dies. Uh, smoking uh, is a uh, risk factor for breast cancer. Poor diet, use of uh, oral contraceptives. Use of oral con contraceptives. Birth control pills. Birth control pills can cause breast cancer. Any idea why? What's wrong with birth control pills? What's, what's good about them? Well, they keep you from getting pregnant. I guess that's the good thing. What's the bad thing about them? In the old days, the first birth control pills were, were like death pills. They had so much estrogen in them that, that women were coming down with all kinds of horrible things. They were, they were making women blind. 
as strange as that may seem. So what's wrong with birth control pills? It's the estrogen. It's the extra estrogen. Your body knows exactly how much estrogen that it needs. If you take birth control pills, then you're increasing the amount of estrogen that you're, you have in your system. Now, most women, it's, it, and it's not that high. I mean, we're not killing people with, our, with, with birth control pills anymore. But you have a higher risk for breast cancer if you take birth control pills. Uh, the presence of other diseases of the breast, uh, radiation exposure, and use of alcohol, all of these can cause uh, breast cancer. They are risk factors in breast cancer. Uh, families with inherited breast cancer show uh, breast cancer in two or more close relatives. Early onset breast cancer in more than one generation. Cancer in both breasts, one uh, plus family member. Uh, frequent ovarian cancer. Ashkenazi Eastern and Central European Jewish ancestry with a family history of breast and, ovar and or ovarian cancer. And, uh, oops, I'm sorry. We'll talk about the rest of that later. As fascinating as all that is. Any ideas why?